This conference will now be recorded. Good morning and welcome to another study of the Word of God. This is Minister Jerry Spencer from Bank Street Memorial Baptist Church. Uh, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. I want to thank everyone for listening in today. I pray that the Lord has blessed you this past week, and I pray that the study for today may be a blessing as well. Again, the Inspirational Bible Study Ministry, its mission is to bring men and women to a saving knowledge of Jesus the Christ through the study and the teaching of the Word of God. Our study for today will be coming from Genesis chapter 13, verses 8 through 18. And the title of it is Abram Builds an Altar. Let us take a moment and open up in prayer. Let us pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, we praise you this day in the name of Jesus for all that you have done and all that you will do in our lives. I pray, O oh Heavenly Father, now that the, the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart might be acceptable in thy sight. I pray, O oh Heavenly Father, that now the Holy Spirit will take full control of this Bible study ministry. I pray this, Father, in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Okay, brothers and sisters. Laws willing, next week our study will be coming from... 1 Kings chapter 8, as you can see, there are a few verses there that are broken up. Chapter 8, verses 22 through 24, uh, 37 through 39, verse 46, and verses 48 through 50. And it speaks about Solomon dedicates the temple. Our study of Titus concluded with Paul giving instructions to his young disciple, who was the church leader on the island of Crete. This was last week's study. To avoid foolish disputes, he tells, uh, tells Titus, uh, to avoid genealogies, contentions, and strivings about the law, because he says they were unprofitable and useless. Conversely, the truth of God's word is excellent and profitable and lies in stark contrast to heretical and useless teaching. Leaders in the churches today should know that Paul's words are just as true now as they were then. False preachers or teachers are oftentimes subtle in their approach, yet purposeful. It is designed to deceive the congregation and it leads to divisiveness. While all may look normal from the outside, within is a church that is no longer functioning effectively. And if not careful, will become a lukewarm church. But a church that preaches and teaches sound doctrine, having a thorough knowledge of the word of God and the inspiration of the Holy Spirit it will flourish and it will function and it will grow, brothers and sisters. Though Paul tells Titus and he tells Timothy as well to reject individuals who cause divisiveness in the church, he is telling them to do as leaders in their church and their responsibility to remove divisive individuals if they will not adhere to church doctrine and leadership. The same admonishment applies today. It is needed to ensure the preservation and communication of sound doctrine, a proper church order and proper church order and discipline. And as prophesied, as prophesied rather, this kind of order and discipline is lacking in some churches today. Paul warned that some churches of the future will not endure sound doctrine, he says, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables, according to 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 3 and 4. 
Sound doctrine is not easily accepted in some churches today because it convicts the hearers and makes them uh, feel uncomfortable, if you will. Many would rather just hear sermons or teachings that are comfortable, comforting and reassuring um, and more in line with their lifestyle and way of thinking. Those prosperity sermons, if you will. Something easy on the ears. Sadly, friends, we find this type of teaching in small churches as well as so-called mega churches. We find it in false religious groups and in cults who twist the word of God for their own selfish purpose and gain. But the wise leader will reject divisive persons who refuse to change after being admonished by the church leader, knows that behind such divisiveness is the enemy of God's people. So our study today takes us back to the Old Testament, to the 13th chapter of the book of Genesis, where after being instructed by the Lord to get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you, Abram, at the age of 75, departed the city of Haran as the Lord had spoken to him, believing that what the Lord had promised he was able to deliver to make you a great nation, the Lord says, and to make your name great and a blessing. After a brief stay in Egypt because of the famine in Canaan, Abram and his family return to Canaan, returning to the Negev as far as Bethel. This was the place where Abram had set up his tent when he first entered Canaan between Bethel and Ai, to the place of the altar which he had made there at first. And there, the scripture tells us, Abraham called on the name of the Lord. But not too long after returning to Canaan, a family problem arose. Both Abram and Lot, Abram's nephew, had possessions so great when they left Haran that they could not dwell together. And with so many flocks and herds, the land was not able to support them. And this resulted in strife between the herdsmen of Abram's livestock and the herdsmen of Lot's. So a decision must be made to fix this problem. And this takes us to our study for today. In Genesis chapter 13, verse 8, it says, So Abram said to Lot, Let's not have any quarreling between you and me or between your husband and mine, for we are close relatives. Now, the territory surrounding Abram and Lot was in the southern part of Canaan on the west side of the Jordan River. With Jordan, which is called Transjordan, being on the east side of the river. Now, it was known that the success of nomadic life depended upon the land's ability to provide water and land. Canaan and Jordan had enough land for such occupation, but apparently Abram and Lot's cattle seemed to have been confined to the Negev region of southern Canaan, and eventually strife broke out between Lot's herdsmen and Abram's herdsmen, which led to arguments and contention. Family contentions are not new in the Old Testament, friends. We find such contentions between Cain and Abel, between Jacob and Esau, and between Jacob and Laban. So Abram proposes a solution. He says in verse 9, Is not the whole land before you? Let's part company. If you go to the left, I'll go to the right. If you go to the right, I'll go to the left, he says. So what's happened is a conciliatory tone is struck from the words of Abram. But Abram must have understood that the Lord had instructed him to go to a land I will show you, according to the scriptures, and that land being the land of Canaan, west of the Jordan River. 
If Abram was talking about leaving Canaan, Canaan, this would have resulted in him being disobedient to the Lord's instructions, which would have affected Abram's blessings and his progeny, his descendancy. Or Abram could have been referring to just moving further north in Canaan. Nonetheless, Abram gives Lot a choice. He says he could stay where he was and Abram would leave or Abram or Lot could leave. Now, some of us have been in situations in life. I know I have. Be it at home or church or job or journey where we had to make a decision either to stay or to leave. After assessing the situation, some would decide to leave based on the hope that, quote, the grass will be greener on the other side. But we find in Genesis chapter 13, verse 10, that Lot looked around and saw that the whole plain of the Jordan towards Zoar was well watered. So he's looking on the east side now. Like as the scripture says, like the garden of the Lord, which is the garden of Eden, like the land of Egypt. This was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, however. So given the lifestyle of nomadic herdsmen and their dependence upon land that was fertile and well watered, Lot surveyed the land of Jordan, east of the Jordan River, and he decided to leave and settle in that part of the Middle East. In his eyes, the plain of Jordan was more than suitable for him, for his cattle and herd, even more fertile than the land of Canaan. So his choice, however, would later turn out to be the worst decision he could have ever made, not because of the landscape, brothers and sisters, but because of the lifestyle of the people who lived in that area. When looking back on our lives, how often did we sometimes say, this was a bad decision? There's no need to go into details, friends. We've all made such decisions. We've all made bad decisions in life, just as Lot is about to make his first one. And had we not turned to the Lord for salvation, only God knows where we would have ended up in life. In verse 11, the scripture says, So Lot chose for himself the whole plain of the Jordan and set out towards the east. The two men departed. So Lot may have thought that he had made the better decision given the abundance of water and fertile land on the east side of the Jordan River, but his decision was based on the land that he saw. He could have later, and it would have been a much wiser choice to visit that region, which would have given him more information as to what the people of the land were like as well. In, in Canaan, Abram knew what the people was like living among, living among them, the Perizzites and the, Can and the Canaanites, who at worst were ceremonially unrighteous in their worship of idols and even in the sacrifices of their children. But the people in the cities east of the Jordan River were sexually immoral as well as, un uh, as, well as ceremonially unrighteous. Sometimes we find ourselves in situations like this regarding relationships, lifestyles, careers. The unregenerate individual, of which we were all before we believe, often makes decisions based on what we see and how we feel. This can lead to self-deception as well as, as was in the case of Lot and this would come to be a devastating decision. Not only has it has it come has it come uh, become to be devastating in our lives at times, but it will become devastating to Lot as well. In verse in verse twelve, Abram dwelt in the land of Canaan. This is where God wanted him to be, and Lot dwelt in the cities of the plain and pitched his tent even as far as Sodom. 
And so, as divine providence would have it, Lot made the decision to leave, probably thinking he had gotten a better deal. But spiritually speaking, friends, it was the wrong choice. Lot would go from being a nomadic herdsman like Abram, living near Sodom, and later living in Sodom, he would find himself sitting at the gates, a place of importance. He will transition from being a nomad to becoming a permanent foreign resident of Sodom. According to Genesis 19.2, and I encourage you to read Luke chapter 15, verses 11 through 32. In verse 13, it says, but the men of Solomon were exceedingly wicked and sinful against the Lord. This was what Lot did not know, friends. This was the moral climate of the region he was about to live in. We are given a snapshot of the lifestyle of the people and the nature and depravity of the people of Sodom. Here is the earliest mention of the Bible, in the Bible rather, of the morally depraved act of homosexuality. That according to verse 13, as an act that is wicked and sinful against the Lord. The wickedness and moral depravity in Sodom and Gomorrah were evidenced by the acts of the men of the city. We find in Genesis chapter 19, verse five, where it reads, and they, the men of the city, called to Lot and said to him, where are the, where are the men who came to you tonight? <clears throat> Excuse me. Bring them out so that we may know them carnally. <clears throat> In other words, that we may have sex with them. The immoral wickedness of these cities would later reach a point, brothers and sisters, would later reach a point, <clears throat> excuse me, where salvation would no longer be possible, which means that there was much more wickedness being committed than just homosexuality. Not one soul of the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah were capable of repentance. Only righteous Lot and his family would survive was about to come upon these cities. So when the Lord gave commandments to the children of Israel, one of the moral commands that was found in Leviticus chapter 18, verse 22 says this, you shall not lie with a male as with a woman. It is an abomination. The word abomination from an ethical sense is that which is wicked and from a moral sense as being disgusting and abhorrent. The moral law of God still stands today, brothers and sisters. And if that in the New Testament, Paul wrote in first first Corinthians chapter six, verses nine and 10, he said this, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, he says, the sexually immoral, idolaters, adulterers, passive homosexual partners, practicing homosexuals will not inherit the kingdom of God. So I want you to listen very carefully, friends. This has to do with those individuals who willfully and purposely practice and do these things and will not repent. This also applies to those who stand at the pulpit being an affront to our God, whose lifestyle consists of such immoral and depraved acts. Do not think that they will inherit the kingdom of God. In Genesis chapter 13, verses, four, verses 14 and 15, it says, And the Lord said to Abram, after Lot has separated from him, the Lord said this, lift your eyes now and look from the place where you are 
northward, southward, eastward, and westward. For all the land which you see, I give to you and your descendants or his seed forever. There were no conditions to this, friends. There were, God did not give Abram a condition. After Lot leaves, the Lord reveals to Abram the territorial promise without conditions. Now, briefly speaking, the land promised to Abram's descendants, beginning with Isaac now, can be reckoned to about 13,700 square miles. The average size of ancient Israel was about 12,000 square miles. But did you know today it is just over 8,000 square miles? Being divided up by the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. In verse 16, the Lord also says, he says, and I will give your descendants as the dust of the earth. So that if a man could number the dust of the earth, then your descendants can also be numbered. <clears throat> now here is the second promise of God, that of Abram's descendants. At the time of the Lord's promise, Abram was 75 years old and childless, according to Genesis 15:3. And his wife, Sarah, was 65 years old. It would be another 25 years, friends, before Abram would see his first and only true offspring between him and Sarah, according to Genesis chapter 21, verse 5. But God's promises are sure, friends, and Abram's faith was solid. And for God to promise the same thing twice is a reassurance that it will certainly come to pass. Listen to these words from the Lord God. And I will make your descendants, first of all, as the dust of the earth, verse 16. But then the Lord again says to Abram, look now toward heaven and count the stars if you are able to count them. And he said to him, so shall your descendants be. This is Genesis 15, 5. The land occupied by the Jews today, friends, was promised to Abram's physical descendants thousands of years ago by God. Genesis 21, 12. Though Ishmael was Abram's first son, it was not through Sarah and the scriptures are clear. For in Isaac your seed shall be caused, called. Genesis 21, 12. Abram had a son by Hagar the Egyptian, which we have the Arab descent, which came to the Arab, the Arab descent. But Abram also has six more sons by his wife Keturah, which were also of Arab descent. <clears throat> and it says that uh, according to, according to uh, the scriptures, that Abram has six sons by his wife Keturah, whom he married after Sarah's death in Genesis chapter 25, verses 1 and 2. But Paul writes this, Paul says, nor because they are his, being Abram's descendants, are they all Abraham's children. On the contrary, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Isaac. In other words, friends, it is not the children by physical descent who are God's children, but it is the children of the promise who are regarded as Abraham's offspring, according to Romans chapter 9, verses 7 through 9. And this promise came through Isaac and Jacob, who was later renamed Israel. But Abram's dis spiritual descendants would become much greater than his progeny who dwell 
in the land. Hence the terms dust of the earth or as the stars of heaven. These signified that all believing Jews and Gentiles who have the faith of Abram, which are as the dust of the earth or as the stars of heaven. Dare I say, brothers and sisters, what the Lord God is saying is that there will be those believers, Jews and Gentiles, who believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Dare I say that there shall be millions upon millions who will become Abraham's spiritual descendants when they have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, just as Abraham believed God. And so in verses, uh, in, in verse uh, chapter 13, verse 17, the Lord says, Arise, walk in the land through its length and its width, for I give it to you. Again, brothers and sisters, there were no conditions. To walk the land was to claim the land. So the Lord gives Abram a directive to go and claim all the land which he, which you, he says, will walk upon all the land that abram's feet touched will be his according to the word of god and lastly friends in verse 18 then abraham moved his tent and went and dwelt by the terabith trees of mamre which are in hebron and built an altar there to the lord Though Bethel was the first place of worship, Hebron would be Abram's final choice to settle. And there he built an altar and he called upon the name of the Lord. As you will see throughout Abraham's life, that all that God had commanded him to do, Abraham was obedient. All that the Lord promised him, Abraham believed that promise and in believing that promise the lord god swore to abraham because the scripture says he could swear by no more no greater because there's none greater than our god he swore to abraham all that he had promised abraham it was going to come to pass and it has it has This ends our study for today, brothers and sisters, and I pray that it has been a blessing to you. I pray that God's will, we will meet again next week, and we will continue our study in the Old Testament. So until we meet again, may the Lord bless you, brothers and sisters, and may the Lord be kind to you and your families. Amen.